he looked out across the ocean, ignoring the ruined village behind him. The world was dead. The ocean remained. Buried in the shadow of the lighthouse, it seemed to stretch on forever, deep, dark, unfathomable. He looked up to the darkening sky, drawn on by the lonely cry of a circling gull. Perhaps he had remembered better times. Summers passed, and this place was filled with laughter of children, and sun-soaked lovers still walked hand in hand. But that was before the plague. Before the Lazarus virus turned the world into a yawning grave, where dead did not rest, but stalked the last vestige of humankind a terrible hunger. Shivering, he turned up his collar against the cold sea spray, shouldering his pack and heading back into the village, his eyes alert for any form of movement. But there was nothing. No telltale groans, no shambling horror emerged from the shadows. There were only the sighing of the wind and the sound of the ocean as it lapped hungrily at the harbor's concrete sides. He walked on, passing boarded-up shops and crumbling buildings, wary of the slippery seaweed underfoot. The place reeked of decay, the sharp tang of sea salt perfumed the air, and he fancied he could already feel it encrusting his skin. A sign creaked in the groaning wind, and he looked at the sky again soon. Walking around in the light of the day was dangerous enough, but to be caught out after dark it was madness, bordering on suicidal. The loss of electricity had turned the night into something more primal. A willing conspirator, the ally of the hungry dead. Hurrying away from the harbor, he climbed a set of slime-covered steps that led up the hill toward the waiting house that seemed to loom above him. Their peeling paint and smashed window only adding to his sense of forbidding and isolation. Suddenly from behind him came the sound of flapping sails. He spun around, weapon raised, heart beating hard in his chest. It was only the sound of ancient hulls bobbing and scraping together, their torn sails flapping and twisting in the growing wind that pushed against him, determined to drive him back as if eager to mock his feeble efforts. And why not? What was he now, anyway, but a living parasite in the bowels of a long, dead world? A carrion beast picking over the corpses of a decaying animal, always on the run, too scared to live, too afraid to die, and not for the first time since the compound was overrun on that terrible night of blood and terror did he wonder if he had died like all the rest and was now living in his own version of hell. Yet he went on, driven by a promise, a promise to come back to this place. He had something he needed to do, a request ushered forth from bloody lips, a boon, and a last wish he intended to grant. He was cresting the top of the hill now that opened up onto a field where rusting swings creaked and a weed-strewn slide stood like the skeletal remains of some long-dead animal. Memories tried to crowd him, laughing children, a strong hand at his back soaring into the air, the wind on his face. With an almost inhuman struggle, he pushed them away, not feeling the tears on his face as he approached a line of nearby houses. He walked slowly, unslinging his rifle as he passed broken windows and shattered doors, watchful for any sign of movement. His ears attuned with the slightest noise, and he wondered where all the denizens of the village had disappeared to. Or perhaps the sea took them, he thought, with a shudder, down into the dark, down into the deep. And finally, he stopped in front of a house a little apart from the others. The door and windows had all been boarded up, all but one. The right downstairs window was shattered, the boards broken and scattered about the weed strewn driveway, curtains stained with what could only be old blood, dried and flaking, flapped at his approach, blowing in the wind as if bidding him welcome. Towing the old boards aside, he slung his rifle across his back and drew his sidearm. And quickly, he grabbed up the flapping curtains and yanked them down, giving him his first 
an interrupted look inside. Seeing no movement, he climbed into the room, mindful of the broken glass that lay strewn about. The room had once been a living room. A mildew-covered sofa lay overturned in one corner. What was left of a broken, splintered coffee table lay smashed on what had once been a furry white rug, now knotted and covered with mold. The wallpaper was slime-covered and peeling. A damp, putrid smell defiled the air, and he knew one of the hungry dead was near. Slowly, he unbuckled his pack and let it fall to the floor, keeping a wary eye on a nearby door that he presumed led off into the rest of the house. Now free of his burdens, he crept towards the door, gunned down by his side. He was just reaching out with a trembling hand when his booted foot came crunching down on a stray piece of glass. From the other side of the door came a low groan as something threw itself against the door. Wincing, he took a step back, licking his lips nervously, his heart jackhammering as the thing behind the door continued its pounding. The door was starting to shake now, small cracks appearing in the splintered wood. The thing would be upon him any minute. Slowly, his mind made up. He lunged forward and threw open the door, catching the thing in mid-swing, causing it to come crashing forward, falling heavily to the floor. With a cry, he just managed to jump out of the way of its twisting fingers. The thing had once been a man, and a big one at that, now dressed in the remains of blackened jeans and torn t-shirt. With a low groan, it slowly came back to its knees, its gray eyes never leaving his face as it snarled, white foam dripping between its chomping jaws. Finally, he came forward as it tottered to its feet. Forgive me, he whispered, bitter tears in his eyes. He pulled the trigger. Ending the creature's misery in a single shot and an explosion of sulfur smelling smoke. For a moment, he just stood listening to see if the noise had drawn any unwanted attention. There was nothing but the lengthening shadows and the poor crumbling figure at his feet. Turning, he chambered another round and headed forward into the house. He was in a narrow hallway now, a set of carpeted stairs that led to the next floor. He ignored the stairs and walked down the hall, not looking at the pictures that hung on the walls, as he headed towards a door that lay wide open, revealing a dusty-looking kitchen within. Taking a deep breath, he darted his head across the threshold, taking in the room in a quick glance. There was nothing. Nothing but sagging cabinets. A rusty-looking sink and a long breakfast table covered in a dusty plastic tablecloth and a door. A closed door, leading out into a backyard, but it was not this door that drew his attention. It was the other door. The small door built into the back of the room. It was this door he stumbled over to, resting his cheek heavily against the cold wood. There was a sound coming from behind it, a low groaning, perhaps the clinking of chains. Fumbling in his pocket, he drew out a small torch and threw open the door, his gun pointing down into the darkness. It was the smell that sent him reeling back, the smell of rot and the sharp tang of vinegar. Cursing, he slammed the door and staggered back, leaning heavily against the kitchen table where he, leaning heavily against the kitchen table where he was noisily sick. He stayed that way for some time, bent over, breathing hard, before standing and wiping the cold sweat from his brow. Okay, he muttered. Okay, let's get it done. Once again, he threw open the door and ignored the smell. Heading down into the darkness, his light cutting through the murk like a laser beam, taking in the destruction all about him. Glass lay scattered all about puddles of sharp-smelling vinegar and black, rotting vegetables stained shattered pieces of wood and old shelving, but he held. But he hardly noticed any of this as his torch fell upon the woman tied to a nearby wall. She wore the remains of a summer dress, her long, blonde hair matted and filthy. She saw him and went wild, straining against the ropes that had been hastily tied about her waist, securing her to a nearby pipe. Over time, she had managed to wiggle her arms free, leaving a goodish amount of flesh behind. She strained towards him, her filthy blackened fingers twisting, eager to tear his flesh, 
He felt something welling up inside him and clamped his teeth down hard, blocking the scream behind his lips. He raised his gun. His hand rock steady. And fired. Pulling the trigger over and over again, he was screaming now, his eyes stinging, his throat clogged with gun smoke. At last the creature lay still. Turning, he fled upstairs. He had to finish this before his resolve crumbled. He did not stop. He didn't hesitate. But threw the door open that led into the backyard and fell into the coming night. The boy didn't move, even when he called his name. Sean, he whispered, the last of his defenses crumbling as he looked at his brother. It was exactly as he last saw him all those years ago. His big brother, Sean, now his little brother, frozen in time like some wretched lost boy. A waif staring up at the moon in his Thomas the Tank Engine pajamas. Sean! He cried out, crawling towards the boy. I came back for you, Sean. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. The boy turned, his gray eyes filled with moonlight and stumbled forward, arms outstretched, a low groan falling from his slack lips. The man held out his arms. Sean, he whimpered. The boy fell into his arms for a moment. They knelt, and it seemed to the man a glint of recognition flashed in the boy's face. But was gone, replaced by a terrible hunger. Hissing, the boy lunged forward, tearing into the man's shoulder. He didn't struggle or cry out as he raised the gun and rested it against the boy's head. Forgive me, Sean, he said, and pulled the trigger. The boy went limp in his arms, and he held him close, and he rested the cold barrel of the gun against his own temple. He thought of his dying uncle, who had saved him on that first night. They had fled. His mother turning and biting his father as he tried to tie her down in the basement, and his father foaming at the mouth, biting poor Sean as he fled into the yard to escape. Then, coming after him, his uncle fighting his father off, grabbing him up, escaping, smashing through the boarded-up window. Sounds of sirens, fire in the night, and finally, the... The compound, now gone like everything else, and his promise to come back, to lay his family to rest. The world had fallen into ruin. There was only him, this poor, wasted boy in his arms. A single tear ran down his face and fell onto the dead boy's cheek reflecting the moonlight. I'm coming, Sean. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you all thank you so much for listening to tonight's story. Or watching tonight's story if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, that means you're probably on the podcast that's available on iTunes, on the Google Play Store, and is now actually available on Spotify and doesn't use as much data. So, hey, that's a thing. If you guys aren't listening on YouTube or Spotify, then I have no idea how else you could have found me. Unless you found one of those books on Amazon. You know, the Creepypasta Collection, Volume 1, Volume 2. Those are things, too. Oh, well. I don't know how you would have heard me there, seeing as this was recorded like two years after those came out. Uh, well, anyway, thanks for listening, folks, and sweet dreams.